good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a subject that I was asked to talk about, flipping the classroom, and I'll, I'll keep the humor to a minimum, uh, obviously. Um, I have no disclosures other than the fact that what I'm about to do for the next 20 minutes is the exact opposite of what I'm trying to teach you to do when you're educating people. So don't pay attention to what I'm doing right now as an example of flipping the classroom. So in order to understand classroom flipping, which is an instructional method, you really kind of have to understand how people learn. And there are numerous theories surrounding how people learn. One of the ones that is used most often in medical education, be it CME or GME, is the a theory proposed by a guy named Kolb around 1984, and it's called the experiential framework for learning. They're all theories, right, because we can't get in somebody's head and dissect out how they learn. So they're theories that are tested. But this one seems to stand up to the testing in graduate medical education, and it works in a cycle like this. What it starts with is some sort of an experience that you have, either a uh, hand-to-hand -hand experience, like touching a patient or interacting with a human being, or an experience where you read something or gain some new fact about a concept that you hold in your head as knowledge. After you have that experience, you will reflect on that experience. You will consider how that experience relates to the mental model that you currently have about that subject in your head. And then you will take that reflection and that experience and you will try and insert it into that mental model that you have in your head, either adapting the mental model that you have to accept that new piece of information or using that piece of information to reinforce your model or adjusting your model dramatically if the piece of information considerably contradicts the way your model of that currently works. And then what you start to do is you experiment. The, you will actively make decisions based on that new mental representation that you have and use that experimentation the next time you have another experience on that. And so essentially what knowledge is, when you learn it, is, is really a model of reality that we have experienced. We're repeatedly seeing events, learning new things. We take that information and we insert it into this mental model that you have in your head, uh, cognitive framework, so to speak. So it's not like early childhood learning where the brain is essentially empty and devoid of a lot of experience and every experience is being shoved in there. This, everybody comes to us once they're an adult with an established set of models in their head based on the experiences they've had. So what's getting in the way? Well, one of the problems in graduate medical education, and this actually reflects to any type of education, but I'm going to specifically focus on graduate medical education, is that your clinical experiences and your experiences in general vary quite widely. Uh, different programs, different trainees in the same program will have dramatically different experiences. They will see different patients, different presentations of those patients. Uh, they will see different time uh, for interacting with those patients. So all that experience is very dramatically different from trainee to trainee. In addition, their opportunity to reflect on it and consider it is going to be varied from trainee to trainee. Some trainees will have more time and consider some event more deeply and integrate it into their model. Others will be unaware that what they just witnessed was a dramatic shift for them in their mental model because the event that they just witnessed or participated in is so far removed from their current mental model that they really can't even integrate it into their working system that they have. And then finally, uh, there's, there's less and less opportunities now for experimentation. One of the prime concerns about graduate medical education over the years is the lack of autonomy. Uh, our trainees have less and less opportunities to experiment, to really sort of make decisions based on that mental model and then see how those decisions play out. We've taken that away from them for a host of reasons, but it affects their ability to build and experiment on those models. And so what you end up with is enormous variation in what our trainees actually know and how their model actually looks inside their head for any subject that we try and teach them. And then 
what types of knowledge are there? That's the other thing you sort of have to know when you start talking about how I want to teach somebody in a classroom. Educators love pyramids and cycles. We do it all the time. And so this is another educator's model by a name, man named Bloom. He developed a taxonomy for knowledge in general. What is knowledge? What are the types of things that we actually learn? And what he does is he, as at hierarchical here, you can see at the bottom are the easy stuff. These are the things that don't take many experiences to mold or model. These are factual-based information. You can see in our field it would be things like anatomy, physiology, the staging systems we just heard about. These are fact-based pieces of information that we insert in. They're relatively basic. It doesn't take a lot of experience or reflection or experimentation to learn these things. On the other end of the scale, though, at the top of Bloom's hierarchy are the really complicated things. Creating, evaluating, and analyzing. Creating being the most complex. And when you think about what clinical decision making is, when we as doctors have to make a clinical decision, it really can be separated into three groups of decisions. We are either diagnosing a problem, we are then evaluating the extent of that problem, and then we are allocating a treatment. And this works for complications, this works for diseases. When you have a complication, you must first diagnose the complication, then you must evaluate how severe it is, and then you must allocate a treatment for it. Similarly, when you're in the operating room, if you see an anatomical variation, you must diagnose that variation, you must evaluate the extent to which it will impact on the course of your treatment, and then you must make adjustments to your treatment based on that. So that's really, in a nutshell, what clinical decision making boils down to. It's one of those three decisions, usually all three of them going on sort of merged in a similar fashion. Well, obviously, complex things like that require a significantly larger volume of experiences to be able to learn that and create a mental model in your head of how you're going to approach a disease. You're not going to get that out of one sitting like you could, say, the staging system or an anatomy lesson about a discrete area of the body. That's going to take a lot of complex experiences over and over again to slowly modify and adjust the model you have in your head of what you should be doing when you're diagnosing, evaluating, and treating patients. So that's where the problem lies, of course. We have learners that require experiences to help them create the mental models that define their knowledge. And the big problem here is, of course, the thing we really want to teach them, the hard stuff, requires the most experiences in order for them to build an accurate model in their head. Unfortunately, as I said before, we have much less autonomy, much less opportunity for experimentation. You could say this about any sort of educational, even in CME. Not a lot of opportunity is given to us <laughs> by uh, outcomes-based results to experiment. Uh, in addition, there are less opportunities to participate in clinical decision-making for our trainees. Our trainees are asked to be in the operating room more and more. They spend less and less time at the bedside. They spend less and less time in the clinic making those decisions. And then finally, there's actually less interaction with experts when experimenting. The things we do leave them to have autonomy with are the things they do alone at night when we're not around. And so they may actually reinforce bad mental models based on poor judgment or poor experimentation. If they don't have an expert coach to sort of guide them and show them the error of their experimentation, they may actually reinforce. Because there is a thing that we all possess which is called confirmation bias. If you've read Kahneman's books on thinking fast and slow, you know we all fall prey to confirmation bias. And that's when you systematically exclude bits of evidence that don't conform to your current mental model of something you're learning. And we all do this, you know, we have that patient who's post-op day five after their esophagectomy, 
and their heart rate goes up and they spike one temp and we refuse to believe it's a leak, right? And then the next day, a little piece of evidence comes down. You know, now the white count's up a little higher, but we're like, oh, you know, he was coughing a little bit more, so I'm sure it's just a little early pneumonia, right? And you continually do this, and that's just a human trait. And so when there are no experts around, no other viewpoints, you can actually dangerously reinforce an incorrect mental model as you go about learning. And so we have been trying to leverage classroom teaching, so to speak, in graduate medical education to offset some of these changes. And that's what we call didactic lectures and things like that. Well, there's really two options that I'm gonna present. The conventional classroom, which is what we all grew up with, and then this concept of a flipped classroom. So in a conventional classroom, the focus is on the teacher, just like it is right now. That's why I told you at the beginning, my disclosure, I'm doing exactly the opposite of what a flipped classroom is. I am the center of attention right now. All eyes are on me. The focus is on me teaching you, all right? The needs in this audience are not being considered right now. Some of you may have children who are in a flipped classroom model and already know a lot about flipped classrooms. Others of you may have never participated in or run classroom-based teaching, and so I may be speaking well above you. And so usually what happens in a conventional classroom is the teacher teaches to the middle of the class because there is no ongoing assessment during a conventional classroom. You compare and contrast that to a flipped classroom. In a flipped classroom, the focus is on the student, and the real driving force is learning, not teaching. And there is a big difference between learning and teaching. Learning is a personal thing. Teaching is an activity that one does. So in a flipped classroom, the whole goal is to achieve learning. And the needs of the student are what drive the learning and the entire experience in a flipped classroom. And progress is really permitted when there is clear competency developed on a subject, when that mental model that the individual in the classroom coincides with the mental model of the, of the expert, then you can move on. Well, if you show it a different way, if you look at the mechanics of it, these are the two side by side. So in a conventional classroom, the experiences and the facts are provided by me as the lecturer. I sit up here and tell you about a flipped classroom. And then the expectation is for you to leave this room and experiment and reflect upon it on your own. And you may be able to take the information I give you and very easily place it into your mental model and start using it as a new piece of information. On the other hand, you may be thoroughly lost by what I told you and not be able to go anywhere with it. On the other hand, in a flipped classroom, the experiences and the facts are delivered prior to the class. So you would have gotten my lecture and you would have gotten some readings on a flipped classroom. And then we would come to the classroom and we would reflect and experiment together in the classroom with me acting as the expert. It's much more like a coaching model than a teaching model. So the teacher takes on a role of a coach and the learners, the students, are actually driving their learning. So what is the basic approach to this? This would be sort of the basic system if you wanted to set it up. You can see on the side there, prior to class, two events minimum would have to take place. The first thing is you're gonna to have to establish some very clear objectives about what you want to do during the, uh, the next classroom event, all right? And so for an example I put here, maybe an objective would be be able to efficiently and appropriately stage a patient with lung cancer, all right? The next thing that would happen then is I, as the teacher, would have to provide you with the facts and the experiences necessary to realize that objective. So I would provide you with some chapters from some textbooks about staging patients. I would give you the literature on the guidelines that have been written about staging. I would maybe give you a videotape lecture from the GTSC that was just done on staging of lung cancer and let you listen to that as well. And you would be expected as the learner to review that material prior to your arrival to the class. 
When you get to the class, what happens next is the first five to 10 minutes are spent briefly reviewing the material that you went over. Not going over it again, not me lecturing you about that material, but just making sure that there were no gaps in your comprehension. Did you understand the literature? Was there any part of the literature or the video that you watched that you were a little confused about and didn't understand? We'd quickly go over that, make sure everybody's on the same page, and then we would go into the practical application of the knowledge. That's where we start experimenting. And this is where the real work of the teacher might come because they would have to prepare a series of cases that could be offered to the trainees at their various levels and there's constant on the fly assessment going on. So I'm asking a question of a trainee and if I see that that trainee has a gap in their knowledge that's earlier, I would send them another case right then and there. Or I would have one of my other more advanced trainees point out what mistakes that first trainee made and how they could adapt. And so a lot of reflection and experimentation is going on right then and there in the classroom, allowing the individual to create that mental model right in front of me, the expert, so I can quickly twist them and move them back in the right direction that they need to go. And then at the end, if there's clear gaps that still have not been addressed, you could assign additional work for them to do. And you could say, look, I want you to you know, go back and review these cases again and maybe meet with me in a few days. We'll go over it again. But usually if you keep the objectives tight, you can get it done. If you want to go to a more advanced approach, you can still start with the same clear objective at the beginning. You can again provide all that content that you want them to review, but then you can actually assign them a task prior to their arrival. And frequently when I present this stuff to my faculty, the pushback I get is, well, you know, they're not gonna read. They'll just come and expect to be spoon-fed when they lay in the class. And so here's where you can put a little task on them, and you could actually ask them to come prepared with questions from the material they read, or take it even a step further. Ask your trainees, especially the more advanced ones, to create the cases that will be used during the classroom, and actually let them run the case. You actually learn a lot about their gap in knowledge based on the case they produce to use in the classroom. You again review with so the trainees' questions at the beginning of the actual classroom time. You do the same practicing, but again, you could pit one trainee to another. You could have a, a trainee administer the case and then I correct the administration of the case. You can flip it around many different ways, but the goal is to engage various levels of learners in various tasks that, that hit what they want to learn. And then of course, you can find gaps and you can assign remediation, but if you've got a real powerful student in your class, you can use them to oversee the remediation of the weaker student and engage them in group learning like that. So they get the idea that they can continue this outside of the class as well. They don't need to just wait to come to class. And so what does that mean for me as an instructor? Well, it means I don't have to prepare a lecture anymore, all right? That goes away. But what I do have to do is quite a little bit of additional form of work. Well, the first thing is I'm gonna be the one providing the experiences, all right? So I'm gonna have to create those cases or those examples that I can review with my trainee. In addition, I'm gonna give them that time to reflect in the class, uh, and, and that reflection is gonna take away of some probing questions by me on what they just responded to the experience that I gave them. And then as they build that model, we'll come back and we'll experiment on that model. So I'll test them again a little later in the session on a similar scenario or one that has a little twist in it. And so it's really a lot more on the fly work for the instructor and it is a skill just like anything else we do. It's not generalizable. Just because you can operate well doesn't mean you can run this well. It does take some practice to learn how to teach on the fly like this. So this really addresses the obstacles that now plague uh, clinical learning. I think it allows us to to get to trainees at different levels and allows them to bring them together to get a uniform mental model. And, and it, it's this ability to assess on the fly, which is something that's really lacking in our educational. The more we can assess, the better our trainees will do. We've built a system to try and help you with this. This is maybe should have been on my disclosure, but we built the Learn CT Surgery LMS platform specifically to allow flipped classroom design. 
that's the functionality we really wanted to put in it. So when you create an assignment, as you can see there, there's an area for you to insert text. That text can be the instructions for your trainees to prepare questions based on the reading. Or you could actually upload a PDF file of some cases for them to review prior to coming to the class. And then in the second field right there, you can add items, and we're going to have the library functionality is going to improve. Currently, the library is there, but one of the things that we added to this system that wasn't present on the old system is the ability for an institution to upload its own content specifically for its learner. So if you wrote a book chapter that you love and you think that's the best chapter they should read on that subject and you don't like the other chapters, you can upload that to your version of this LMS and assign it to your trainees. And then finally, you can put a quiz in there, and you can actually review that quiz at the beginning of the session as a way to assess whether they actually engaged with the content. In addition, something for the future, a flipped classroom is actually a way to get towards competency-based learning. This is a thing you hear about all the time, or mastery learning. It's going on in educational schools right now. If you think about Khan Academy, the whole concept of Khan Academy is built on mastery learning, this concept that you don't move on to the next step until you've mastered the content at the initial step. And using a flipped design, you can go on that, and when you feel your trainees are at a point where they've mastered that content, you could move them forward to take an assessment, a more summative assessment of that, and check it off, similar to a milestone, and move ahead with that. And that's it. <laughs>